Hi everyone, today we have Dr. Brian Davis here who is a um, sports medicine PM&R physician. He's been a team physician for various USA uh, Olympic and Paralympic teams as well as the National Boxing Association, uh, local, um, local teams like the Sacramento Republic and uh, various other teams as well. Um, he's been practicing in the field over 20 years and um, he's done uh, extensive research in areas like um, exercise metabolism, uh, exercise performance, and injury prevention, which we'll all talk about later on. So, first of all, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for uh, joining in this interview. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for asking me to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of the viewers will enjoy uh, having you on as well. <coughs> so, um, before we actually get into a little bit about kind of like your past, um, what could you just kind of briefly describe what exactly is a PMR physician? So our field, physical medicine and rehabilitation, some people call us physiatrists or physiatrists. Some people just call the, 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 the field physiatry. Basically, our specialty is looking at individuals from the view of disability and trying to move from disability to ability. So whatever you're able to do within your functional realm, we want to be able to maximize that as much as possible. So let's take, for example, somebody who's been injured, some, th something severely like a spinal cord injury. They may not be able to walk, they may have to use a wheelchair. We would have to obviously teach them how to get out of bed. We have to teach them how to get into their chair, how to manipulate their environment, how to be able to get dressed, how to cook for themselves, and basically get back to whatever is the highest level of ability despite the disability. So you can take that in areas like burn management, spinal cord injury, head injury, stroke, amputation, occupational medicine. I've went on further to then focus on sports and musculoskeletal injury, and if you think about it, that's the most minor of all of the disabilities compared to all that other stuff that I just discussed, and you can see how that takes somebody from a level of disability to ability. So each time there's an injury, we've got to try to step in and try to see if we can recover that function. And if we can't, the question is, what can you still do? Can you still do it at the level that you want to compete at or not? Okay. And so why did you choose well, medicine in general, but also PMR in particular, and sports medicine even? Medicine, it's interesting. My, my mother uh, was actually an administrative assistant for many, many years. And one day she just decided that she was going to become a paramedic. Mm -hmm. And I would sit around and I would help her study and I looked at all the pictures. I'm like, wow, look at all this blood and guts. This is great. I love this. Mm -hmm. um, and as I actually learned more about medicine and about injury, uh, it, it just struck me that this was something that I wanted to be able to help other people try to, again, regain function. I was a decent athlete, but certainly never good enough to have made it to any level beyond you know, high school or collegiate. And as I went further along in my studies, I found how much I really enjoyed. I love sports from day one, but I really wanted to help athletes be able to achieve that pinnacle of their success. And I unfortunately dealt with some injury issues when I was young that now in retrospect were treated completely incorrectly based upon the knowledge that we have today. And I think even back then, honestly, I think we knew what was the right and the wrong way to go about doing this mm -hmm. and I set out to make that difference so that people didn't have to go what I went through and that was really what started me into the sports medicine areas. I strongly thought about uh, orthopedic surgery. I did rotations in orthopedics. I did rotations and all the basic stuff, cardiology, internal medicine. I even loved psychiatry. I thought psychiatry was a lot of fun. And I realized that I could take a lot of those areas of interest, including the surgical side, the psychological side, the anatomy, which I love the anatomy of sports and sports medicine, and I was able to put those all together into physical medicine and rehabilitation. I really felt that this was the one field that allowed me to do that best mm -hmm. in terms of moving on and doing sports medicine for an ultimate career. Okay, great. Um, and did you realize that kind of like the errors that the physicians made during your treatment or was that later on as you became a med, med student or a patient? It wasn't until probably almost 10 years later that mm -hmm. as I was reviewing what had happened to me as a young baseball player mm -hmm. and how I was treated back then 
it wasn't until I was in college and actually worked with some trainers and they said, oh, why don't you get some inserts for your shoes? Why don't you work on strengthening the muscles for your back and for your legs? Mm -hmm. And the problems that I had had years ago, which resurfaced when I was in college, I was able to then treat them from that moment forward. And really all it took was some inserts in my shoes, some good stretching exercises, and some good strength exercises. Mm -hmm. Whereas years ago, I had some doctor injecting corticosteroids into my knees, and I was only 12 years old at the time. So now in retrospect, now many years later, thinking, thank goodness, you know, knock on Formica or whatever this is, <laughs> um, I, I was lucky that I didn't end up with, with serious cartilage injury because mm -hmm. of what was injected into my knees at that time. Mm -hmm. So it, it took a long time to recognize that that was an error in the way that, and this was a, a very well-known physician at the time. Mm -hmm. So now looking back saying, you know, I, I, I don't want that to happen, especially to kids. That was huge for me. Okay. Um, so you talked about a little bit about your path through PM and art. What are the different, and, and a little bit about the uh, specialties of PM and art. Could you just kind of elaborate a little bit more on the subspecialties? So physical medicine rehabilitation, anybody who completes the training after your four years of medical school, after you take your two exams to complete medical school, um, you start your internship year, that internship year can either be a straight medicine, a straight surgical, or it can be a mix or a transitional year. I recommend for people going into physical medicine or rehabilitation that you do a year where you're also doing some hands-on skills, getting into the operating room, learning some surgical skills, because I think our hands really are our best tools. So I recommend that you do a transitional internship. That was the pathway that I took as well. Um, after you do your first year, it's then three years of just doing physical medicine and rehabilitation. Depending on which programs you go to, there may be a heavier push towards inpatient, which would be spinal cord, head injury, stroke, amputee, or you can do more outpatient in your program, which would include more of spine, occupational, performing arts medicine, and other musculoskeletal diseases. Mm -hmm. The program that I went to is probably about a pretty close 50-50 mix, and the program here is definitely more heavily weighted towards the outpatient side, mm -hmm. more of that musculoskeletal. Uh, some individuals focus on other disabilities like neuromuscular disease, or they might even focus primarily just on pediatrics, mm -hmm. dealing with children with uh, spina bifida or cerebral palsy. So part of my background, having all of that information and disability, I then went and did a lot more in working with athletes with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So you can also have that, and I was fortunate enough in the program that I went to that we also had a lot of athletics with, uh, for individuals with uh, physical disabilities, mental disabilities, visually impaired, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so in general, what are the, like, the majority of cases that you tend to see in a day? Uh, I would say it's it's a pretty good mix of individuals that are either uh, consistent recreational athletes mm -hmm. to individuals who may be somewhat sedentary, sedentary who end up with arthritic conditions of the knees or the hips or end up having shoulder issues because mm -hmm. as we get older, if we don't exercise properly or if we over-exercise, and I'll see, I'd probably say in a day, probably a good mix of, of hip, of, of, I'm sorry, of knee and shoulder are probably the, the, the majority of things that I'll see in a day. And it can range in age. I think my youngest athlete right now is 13, and I think my oldest patient is 93. Yeah. Um, and, and it can really be just about anything in between. We, we do see a fair amount of people with knee arthritis mm -hmm. because that is just so prevalent, so common see a lot of individuals with tendon issues at the hips, what some people call bursitis, although it's usually not true bursitis or a similar type of scenario, mm -hmm. the shoulder rotator cuff issues, mm -hmm. very common. Take care of a lot of uh, throwing athletes. I've got quite a few gymnasts in my program that I'm taking care of, a lot of swimmers, a lot of cyclists. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a fair amount of biomechanical evaluation, looking at how you run, how you ride, looking at your exercise so part of our day might be consumed doing that as well mm -hmm. so we actually have a specialized program our, our, our performance lab where we'll mm -hmm. actually evaluate individuals so that might get thrown in during the day as well 
Uh, we do a lot of ultrasound, a lot of uh, both imaging for diagnostic and for therapeutic reasons, using mm -hmm. it to guide our injections. Mm -hmm. So I'd probably say on any given day, I'll probably see at least five or six of individuals needing injection, whether it's under ultrasound guidance or not, which of mm -hmm. course is a whole other set of training that yeah. we've had to include in our in our day-to-day stuff just yeah. since since I started an ultrasound really didn't exist in the office but now over the course of the last 11 12 years that's been a mainstay mm -hmm. of what we've been providing for people mm -hmm. I've, I've heard even lately of um, like like phone like attachments for like ultrasound that they're trying to like like develop for consumers I, I know that some of that technology is out there. We're actually going to be reviewing some, some of the newer equipment that's available. They're trying to make it smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. The problem is when it gets too small, it becomes easy for somebody to be able to walk off with it. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a busy clinic, anybody could just yeah. all of a sudden walk off with a tablet and your $40,000 scanning <laughs> equipment. Um, and then I think the question is making it so accessible to people who don't know how to use it are potentially using it and now there are new exams that are coming out to prove that you actually know what you claim you know mm -hmm. um, I unfortunately I already have to take three exams every 10 years mm -hmm. so I'm not real excited about another one but if it's what's going to prove that that mm -hmm. you have the, 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 the capacity and the skill it's, it's going to be next on the market but these, some of these newer devices I I'm always concerned about the resolution. I'm worried about how deep can it penetrate mm -hmm. and whether or not it's actually going to give us what we think it's going to give us and whether it's being used in the right way. But mm -hmm. we'll see. Yeah. And since we're kind of talking about different cases, uh, I was wondering how does PMNR kind of and sports medicine for the fellowship, if you, if you specialize, if you so specialize, how does it differ from doing like orthopedic surgery or um, being a family medicine, like sports medicine physician? Mm -hmm or um, even things like uh, physical therapists, um, obviously they can't, uh, they won't have the same capacity, but um, how, do, how do all these uh, specialties kind of differ? Well, um, I guess let's try to break it down from the standpoint of uh, those individuals that, that don't have, say, an MD or a DO degree. Let's mm -hmm. kind of separate those folks out. So um, MDs and DOs, or doctors of osteopathic or doctors of allopathic medicine have the option of typically the routes that are available orthopedic surgery family practice internal medicine physical medicine pediatrics rheumatology and emergency medicine and if i'm forgetting anybody out there i apologize those to me are probably the, the main pathways that I see individuals who have gone into medical degrees who have said, I want to practice sports medicine. Um, I, I think we all have a, a strong piece of the pie and each of us I think are going to be stronger in certain areas compared to others. Mm -hmm. I'll just take physical medicine because from moment one of walking into our residency program our entire approach is just based on disability ability, disability mm -hmm. ability. I think we look at biomechanics, we look at the nerve and the muscle system, whether it's doing nerve tests, which is one of the, we're one of the only two specialties that are certified to be able to do those, us mm -hmm. in neurology. There are very few neurologists that I know that's probably one that tends to not be very many that go into sports medicine, but mm -hmm. I understand that they are either developing a pathway or already into it. Um, so we look at things very moment by moment from nerve, muscle, bone, mm -hmm. biomechanics, uh, again, disability to ability. I think our colleagues who are pediatrics, internal medicine, family practice, I think because their crux is much more so on the medical side. Mm -hmm. Your diabetes, your hypertension, your pregnancy, Things along those lines that, that to me are more of the, the straight, when people think of medicine, they think of medical along those lines. And then they'll do one year of an additional fellowship program under most circumstances. So they'll typically do three plus one, we'll typically do four plus one. Mm -hmm. uh, that does tend to change. Orthopedics, because they're five years and then they might do a year of a fellowship in sports medicine. Again, their crux is towards more of the surgical side. 
the surgical reparation, the uh, the biomechanics associated with the surgical recovery and things along those lines. And we're all just part of this huge Venn diagram that in the middle is all of the musculoskeletal and then the rheumatologic folks probably spend more time looking at psoriasis and rheuma, rheuma, rheumatic conditions and then the pediatrician will have their bent a little bit more towards the kids issues and the emergency folks tend to look more at the the severe trauma and how do we do the, the ultrasound testing to look for abdominal damage things along those lines so if I were to compartmentalize as I say there's that group then you say well what else can I do that I don't have to have an MD or a DO degree or even for that matter a doctor of chiropractic's degree um, that would put you into the pathways of athletic trainers, physical therapists, exercise physiologists. I, I probably put chiropractors in with that group as well, even though they do additional training, they don't get the MDDO. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd put them at somewhat commensurate with the MDDO mm -hmm. pathway. Um, and the difference being is that we, we have to sit at the, um, at the point of how do we make decisions and try to get the rest of the team to buy into what we're doing. Whether I'm referring people into chiropractors or physical therapists or to my athletic trainers or to massage therapists, anyone within that group. I don't like calling them ancillary or auxiliary because we're all part of the same package. And we're only as good as the people who are around us that are that are doing the help with us. So if I'm referring to a physical therapist and they're not following my instructions or they see something different than I see, then it can be a completely different situation. But at the end of the day, it falls on my back. Mm -hmm. If something happens, it's my fault. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that a lot of people don't want to have to take the responsibility for. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a doctor before your name, maybe even at the level of a doctor of physical therapy, it, it's gonna come down on, on your shoulders at the end of the day that somebody's gonna say, his fault, her fault. And that's, and that's, a, that's a big thing for people. That's, that's a tough thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that responsibility can be tough. Uh, and, and I don't recommend it for everybody. And, and realize, obviously, the training, the number of years that you have to put in to, to go into medicine, you have to be ready for a lot of sleepless nights. You have to be ready for a lot of angst and dealing with insurance companies and mm -hmm. uh, patients who don't want to do the stuff that you ask them to do. Mm -hmm. it's, it's there. It's there. So um, what's a typical day in the life of a PM&R physician? <clears throat> well, it depends on whether I can get the residents to wash my car or not, because <laughs> then, then it, the day starts off great. Um, I think depending upon where you decide to practice, and that's going to be a very individual decision. I, I decided I wanted to stay in academics primarily because I really enjoy teaching. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm in that environment, I'm protected in some ways that I have a little bit of time that's devoted towards being able to do administrative work, or I have a little bit of time which is devoted towards research. On the other hand, if you are in the private sector, you're probably just go, go, go. Mm -hmm. And every time you leave your office, unfortunately, your office isn't making money. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing for some folks. So I decided to stay in academics because I wanted some of that protection. I also wanted the collegiality of being able to be in an academic center, especially here like at UC mm -hmm. Davis. I can pick up a phone and I can have 70 consultants in my back pocket literally within a minute and the longer that I've been here the longer that I know them and they know me we can have a very quick uh, communication or I can send a message right off the bat and say hey I need some help with something mm -hmm. and that's very hard to find sometimes when you're outside in the in the community so for me I'm lucky enough most of my clinics will start around 8:30. thirty um, it's it's bang bang you're, you're moving from room to room uh, literally any time if you want to come on in and, and film and see what we're doing with patients you're more than welcome to do so but it's it's a very rapid pace you're working with the computer the computer is your foe not your friend your patient is 
is somebody who now has to somehow get interposed between you and your computer because everything has to be documented. So mm -hmm. a lot of time spent on making sure that the computer is set up the way that you want it, working typically till your lunch break and many times even through your lunch break, you're working on charts that you either worked on in the morning or you're dealing with other administrative stuff just before you came in. I was on the phone with insurance companies trying to get items authorized for patients because somebody at the other end is trying to look at my notes and trying to make decisions that I've already made and I've already presumably made with reasonable determination. And instead, they'll still go back and try to second guess you and tell you why you're an idiot. And I'll tell them why they're an idiot and you know, just fight on the phone. Um, and so your day is pretty much typically moving from start to finish. Uh, my clinics typically will run 15 minutes for a follow-up evaluation, 30 minutes for a new evaluation. And you can imagine that not everybody fits into that 15, 30 minute window. So you have to try to either make up time on one end or you gotta try to slow it down on another, give people the time that they need. That's probably one of the most difficult things that I see people dealing with today is being able to manage their time successfully and being able to communicate with patients and being able to give them the data that they need that when they walk out of your room that they feel satisfied, mm -hmm. that you listen to them, that you came up with the correct diagnosis, recommended treatment options, that you've got the appropriate follow-up if there's imaging that's involved, making sure that they understand why they're getting a test, what it entails, uh, potentially if it's gonna be something that's uncomfortable, I wanna make sure that they know that up front. Mm -hmm. um, the administrative duties can be pretty substantial, especially as an academic guy like myself. I was the director for our fellowship for the sports medicine program for 10 years, and there's a lot of stuff that comes from that, having to make sure that your fellow's in the right places doing what he or she is supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, making sure with other research-based stuff, if something falls off during the middle of the day and you've gotta go fix that. Mm -hmm. All of that happens kind of within your, your 8.30 to 5, 5.30 window, mm -hmm. and you've got other people that are around you that if you're moving too slowly and you're pushing everything back for other patients, they get a little, they get a little upset, mm -hmm. they get a little cantankerous. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be able to manage those folks as well. And you've got to be able to be humble. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm running a little late. Can you give me five minutes? I'll you know, be right back in. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, don't worry, I'm going to give you just as much time as you need. And, and, and those are things that just come, I think, with more of an understanding of how to communicate with those folks. But all of that gets packed into your day. Mm -hmm. um, working with nurses, working with athletic trainers, I might get a phone call from somebody from the Sac Republic, hey, we need to bring somebody in right away. Mm -hmm. Great, there goes my afternoon, right? Yeah. Um, so all of those things, you, you've got to put the different hats of administrator versus clinician mm -hmm. versus parent. You know, if I've got a 16 or 17 year old kid who comes in who isn't doing their therapeutic exercises, my first question is, do you really want this? Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to be a bit of a parent but not so much of a parent that they look at their parent and say, well, if I wanted this, I could have gotten this at home. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it takes a very different mindset and communicating with a 90 year old versus a nine year old mm -hmm. are completely different things mm -hmm. and, and trying to get them to understand why you're doing it, getting them to buy into your program. Mm -hmm. That's, that's in essence, that's what your day is all about. And so for hours, does it tend to be like eight to five, five days a week, or is there like call or? <clears throat> so depending upon how you set up your clinic, if you're in a private practice, you may decide to run from seven to six, mm -hmm. seven to seven, who knows? It really just depends upon what your overhead is, what it is that you're trying to do with your patients. I have not looked at this from a monetary perspective. Mm -hmm. I figure that if I do my work and if, I, if I'm teaching, if I'm doing everything, I'll get paid mm -hmm. what I'm supposed to. That's not always the case in all academic environments, mm -hmm. and it's certainly not the case in all private practice environments. So you have to more or less decide what is, what is it that I want to get out of this. If, um, if you decide, hey, I only want to work three days a week, but I'm going to work seven, you know, sun up to sundown, and then you take two to four days off. That's your choice. Mm -hmm. But it means that you're going to have to work harder on the other end because those bills have to get paid. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in academic medicine, there has been a shift towards having to prove your worth. Mm -hmm. 
So in addition to the teaching or to the research funding that comes in, you may be expected to, uh, to, to have to prove your financial worth. How much money can you bring in and how much is getting billed and how much is getting recovered. And that's an area that I, I have to say that is the least favorite part mm -hmm. of what I have to do day to day is to worry about where the money is coming from. Because I want to be able to walk into a room, I want to be unencumbered by all of that information if I possibly can. I want to just sit down, work with the patient, work with the family, whatever I have to do, not have to worry, is this going to get approved? What insurance company do you work with? Where do you have to go for your physical therapy? But that's a lot of the stuff that's, that's part of our day-to-day. In my case, because I am within an academic center, I do have to take inpatient call. So mm -hmm. I am certified still in my primary specialty, mm -hmm. which I had to recertify for last year. <laughs> okay. um, so, you know, rounding on patients with stroke, spinal cord mm -hmm. injury, burn, head injury, you, you name it, mm -hmm. I have to be ready for that as well. So that's, that's my other hat that mm -hmm. goes on. Okay, and so like if you're doing private practice, you don't have to do that inpatient side if you're not interested in it? Unless you decide that your your private practice for some people they may have their their private component may be that they're working at an uh, at a freestanding rehabilitation center. Mm -hmm. uh, it's possible that they may go and consult in a nursing home or a nursing facility in which case you still you've got to go in whenever the patients show up. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand if um, if you're working with a group, uh, I know some people that actually have to cover phone calls for orthopedic surgeons mm -hmm. because they're working within an orthopedic specialty group. Mm -hmm. So they may have to answer calls about infections or pain management. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, if I go in and I work in the hospital, almost 99.9% you know, .9 of it is just going to be what happens in the hospital. Mm -hmm. However, any one of my colleagues who have patients who are with my department and we have 13, 14 physicians, I may get a phone call from a, a, a patient's family about a kid with a neuromuscular problem. Mm -hmm. And I've got to be able to switch the hat right away and be able to say, okay, this is what we need to do. No, this needs to be evaluated urgently. Or no, you can come into the clinic, we'll get you set up in the next couple of days or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And it really depends upon how you set up your practice or how somebody else has set it up for you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's more or less making that decision, making that leap from finishing up your studies, completing whatever additional academic stuff you're going to do, and then say, all right, this is what I want to do in the end, mm -hmm. and trying to find that perfect job. <clears throat> and I usually tell folks that if your job is 85% the way that you like it, mm -hmm. you're probably okay. <laughs> Once you start dipping below that, you're going to start questioning Mm -hmm. your job, your rationale, why am I here, why am I doing this, mm -hmm. I, I think it becomes a harder sell mm -hmm. when, and that's the number I've looked at over the years, it's been 85%, so that's, that's my number anyway. Kind of like the 80-20 rule. That's right, yeah, that's, and that's a good rule to follow because almost everything ends up to be 80-20 or 70-30. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. okay. So I was going to ask about how you pursue different things like working on like Olympic teams and mm -hmm. research and all these other things like while you're uh, still doing clinical practice. How would, how would you recommend physicians kind of go about that? It's a very deep question because there's many different roads to it. Um, I decided very early on that I wanted to work with higher level athletic programs, mm -hmm. whether it was going to be high school, collegiate, and even potentially professional. Um, many times it takes a break. You just got to get lucky. Mm -hmm. And I'll always tell folks, show up early, go home late, mm -hmm. ask a bunch of good, intelligent questions, not just to ask them, but because you really have a care or concern about the answer. Mm -hmm. And when you do those three things, you're going to get the attention, hopefully good attention, for, from other people who are going to say, hey, this is somebody I want to ask to do X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. um, I happened to get my break more or less. I was working in Utah before I came here, before I came to this position. I was in an academic position. and. Um, I had done a fair amount of work with disabled athletes, Paralympic athletes, when I was in my residency. 
when I was and in my fellowship when I was then out as a, as an attending physician, I had a resident who said, "Oh, I'm going to cover a boxing match." I said, "Oh, wait a second. I said, if nobody's there to protect you, how do you know what to do? And I had been working with a number of combatant athletes. I've been practicing martial arts since I was a kid. It was something that for me seemed very easy to at least be there to help. So I started helping with components of our USA Boxing program. So this was locally. Unfortunately, we had one, I want to call him a kid, but at the time he was 28. He had a very severe neurologic injury where he bled inside his head after a match. Based on that, I decided that I wanted to help boxing change its safety protocols for all of its coaches, athletes, etc. I immediately moved into the medical board for USA Boxing. Around that same time, somebody said, oh, we need a physician to help with a swimming uh, Paralympic program in, in South America. And I just got asked to do it. So somebody knew that I had been working with athletes, knew that I was working at the Olympic, Paralympic level. And so now I was working with USA Boxing, I was working with USA Swimming, um, and it more or less kind of snowballed from there. I applied for the position that is available through the U.S. Olympic Committee. They have a two-week physician training program of sorts where they look to see if you're capable or you're of the material to be able to travel with the U.S. teams. Mm -hmm. Now this was back in 2000. Mm -hmm. So at that particular time I did the two-week rotation. They then asked me to do other things for the U.S. Olympic Committee. So some of these things just more or less happened by accident. We then had the track and field championships here. So they needed medical providers. So what I do, I, then I started working with USA Track and Field. So I ended up <laughs> doing events, becoming the medical director for the track and field program here. It just one thing led to another. Mm -hmm. And getting that break, you've, you've certainly got to saddle up next to people who hopefully are going to give you that break. Mm -hmm. And finding the people who have been out there who have done it before. Now there's actually a training program. There's an Olympic physician training program mm -hmm. that is now available that they have in each of the different countries. So a colleague of mine just finished his in Japan. Mm -hmm. Another colleague of mine just finished hers here in the U.S. Um, and in theory, that now gives you the capacity to be able to move into the training or to, to, to be an official physician at the ringside for some of these events. Mm -hmm. So that certainly is along the lines of how you would hopefully get yourself initially involved. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it's going to be the three things. Show up early, go home late, ask your good questions along the way. And... Um, if you decide that you want to work with like local high school programs, it's going to take the legwork, going in, talking to the athletic trainers. I'm interested in doing X, Y, and Z and getting them to buy into that. They may already have somebody who is doing exactly what you want to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Well, just being around, offering your assistance to whoever is the other clinician that's involved. Hey, I'm willing to help out. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to cover games. Uh, here in Sacramento, if you're willing to cover a game on a hundred degree day, you're probably going to get <laughs> you're probably going to get somebody to go sure, <laughs> um, and and that's important. And then having that ability to communicate between athletes and parents and coaches and trainers, the more that you're capable of doing that and doing it in a way that hopefully doesn't ever sound condescending or seem like you're lost or that you're you've got a plan, you stick to it, and if that plan isn't working out that you're able to change and, hey, I made a mistake on this, I'm, let, let's try something else. Mm -hmm. I think that level of humility helps to some extent. Um, and these are going to be things that they're going to be looking at you all the way across the board. Mm -hmm. um, having obtained the soccer team happened to be, we got approached here at the university, they knew that I did X, Y, and Z, got that. Um, they wanted us to put together the marathon. Well, I hadn't put together a marathon before, so I called everybody in the country who I knew who had. 
So what did you do? And you take you, you take that formula that worked and you make sure that you put the right people around you to make sure that you get the job done. Mm -hmm. Now that we're five years in, I got a pretty good mm -hmm. got a pretty good understanding of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so some of it's by luck, some of it's by hard work, um, and then just trying to make sure that you're changing your model as you're going along to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are the misconceptions about PM&R? 20 years ago, if you had asked me that question, I think my answer would be completely different. Mm -hmm. I think that PM&R has become a much more visible specialty to individuals within sports medicine and even to the public much more so than 20 years ago. 20 years ago, if you had asked about sports medicine, almost everybody would have thought about family practice and orthopedics. Mm -hmm. um, and for that matter, pretty much everybody else who I've mentioned would have been left out of that equation, including PM&R. Um, I think that there are still some individuals who think that PM&R doesn't stand for physical medicine, they think it stands for pain management. Mm -hmm. And granted, you can go into pain management if you so choose, but there are obviously many people who don't, um, and who don't enjoy that aspect of, of care. So I think that that's probably a misconception that we're supposed to be the folks that, after everybody else has failed, you handle it. Mm -hmm. There's no question that I do still see a fair number of patients where folks will scratch their head and say, I just don't know what to do here. Mm -hmm. And I'm more than happy to try to see whether I've got some ideas inside the box, outside mm -hmm. of the box. But the misconception that, okay, there's nothing else we can do pm and is just going to put them on narcotics mm -hmm. or just going to tell them to go smoke some pot. Mm -hmm. um, that, I, th I think, is something that even still as, as new colleagues come in, mm -hmm. and because I don't do spine care anymore, I used to as part of my practice and I moved out of that area, there are still people who say, oh, Davis, yeah, the spine guy. I'm like, no. <laughs> um, so trying to, that once you build a practice, you've got to be very careful about how you build it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to see patients with a certain medical condition, then you have to pretty much set your foot in there, closing that door before somebody tries to open it for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's more of an internal uh, preconceived notion that, okay, here's this big bag, where am I going to go? Um, for those who like to do the inpatient side, I think, again, making sure that people understand that we're here to try to improve function. So if somebody is comatose and can't follow commands, that the need to be on an inpatient physical medicine or rehabilitation service is not going to offer this patient any benefit. Mm -hmm. And all you're doing is wasting resources, and that's one of the reasons that many insurance companies have stepped in and said if they can't do three hours a day of combined physical therapy, occupational and speech therapy, then they can't go to your floor. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. And I think being of that mindset from the outset that, hey, how can I make their function better? Mm -hmm. And if all I'm gonna do is make them step one more step inside their home, that's not gonna be very valuable. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to look at how you're using your resources, and I think, again, misconceptions is, well, if we can't do anything and they've got nowhere to go, let's just give them over to PM&R. We just mm -hmm. can't do that. Just can't do that. Okay. And what, what are the most challenging and rewarding aspects of PM&R? Most challenging, <clears throat> I'd probably say insurance has become the most challenging probably for anybody and everybody. So whatever field you go into, there is going to be something that you're going to do within that practice that insurance companies are going to try to either claim is experimental, mm -hmm. claim is not helpful despite research studies supporting the use of a particular technique or medication, mm -hmm. um, or potentially will just deny it outright for unforeseen reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that that has that the pendulum has swung so far in the direction of not providing appropriate care for some patients under some circumstances mm -hmm. that I'm hoping that it's it's at that that end of the 
the swing that hopefully it's on its way back. Mm -hmm. I don't know yet, um, unless this administration and any other begins to truly respect what clinicians, not just physicians, what clinicians are doing and making sure that money is available for research and promoting that research into clinical care. The, the difficulty that we see where you don't continue to progress that spectrum and your entire approach is whatever is the cheapest, least effective, let's just throw that into the pot and see if that works. Mm -hmm. It just it just doesn't cut it because people don't thrive under that under that uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. um, the most rewarding I would have to say is it, it can be something as small as oh gosh thank you doctor I'm sleeping now I'm finally able to sleep on my right side after a year because I've got this tendon problem mm -hmm. and it just took two weeks of physical therapy. And it really wasn't much work on my part. It wasn't really much work on the therapist's part. And of course, you worked really hard, Dr. Davis. But, um, and, and seeing just those little changes that can be substantial. Um, if somebody can't sleep, they are unhappy people. And that's probably one of the things that most patients will be upset and disappointed about. Doc, I still can't sleep. Um, uh, also, the, the reward that we're seeing is oh, I've stopped taking my medication. I'm not using a cane anymore. I don't have to use my brace. And seeing that there's that functional improvement and they walk in, they don't look haggard and tired mm -hmm. uh, like they did. And I'll even type in my note, patient looks tired, you know, frustrated. And next time they come in, they're happy and they're laughing and they've got a good smile on their face. And mm -hmm. you didn't even see their teeth last time because they wouldn't even smile for you. Mm -hmm. Those are those are some of the real positive moments, and and I've been there. I I was lucky enough that I was at the 2004 Women's Paralympic Basketball uh, gold medal, mm -hmm. and I watched the girls cut down the net, and they asked me to cut down the net, and mm -hmm. and that was a great moment, and seeing the the, the joy on their faces. But I was just there in case something happened. Mm -hmm. I didn't really do much to make their dream happen. Mm -hmm. It's being on the back end two, three years ago when they had the shoulder problem that they couldn't propel mm -hmm. their wheelchair mm -hmm. and we were able to institute the physical therapy to then know that they got their medal. Or say for example, this young gal, uh, she actually was at the uh, 2008 Olympics and without going through details, she came back to me after winning her gold medal and thanked me. So that's mm -hmm. being way in the beginning of where the problems occurred mm -hmm. to be able to make that difference and getting her to the right physical therapist and getting her the right you know, psychological mainstream and so forth. And, and to this day, when I run into her at some events, she's like, hey, doctor, okay. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just great to be there and to know that that happened. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a major reward. Sounds, sounds very rewarding. It can be. It definitely can be. Um, so what personalities or <clears throat> people, like certain interests tend to do well in PM&R? I think anybody can thrive here. Mm -hmm. If you don't talk to people, if you don't like talking to people, you probably won't enjoy the specialty. Mm -hmm. Because our job is a lot of communication in terms of discussing what's wrong how are you going to fix it? And if we can't fix it, being able to being able to find the the words and the humility to be able to say, "I'm sorry, we we can't fix this," or "I'm sorry, but you have cancer that's spread." Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that can happen in any industry. Mm -hmm. I think rehab it's so important for that face to face communication, that one on one. They have to buy into what you're telling them. I think it's sometimes easy for a patient to come in and say, oh, I've got heartburn. Okay, here's your pill. Mm -hmm. Okay, you take your pill, you come back, okay, my heartburn's gone. You didn't really have to do very much. I didn't have to do anything to get you to buy into that pill other than the fact that you said my heartburn's gone. Mm -hmm. This takes a lot more work. You're going to have to exercise two to three times a week. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to lose some weight. Um, 
that that takes a lot of rah 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 sis boom ba along with that discussion why is this important mm -hmm. um, one of my frequent discussions with people is you need to lose weight mm -hmm. how do you get them to lose weight fortunately to at this time I don't have to talk to people about smoking cessation anywhere near as much as I used to mm -hmm. that was one of my biggest challenges you need to quit smoking mm -hmm. well but what about this I got some answers I'm a former smoker so I can, I can delve into that mm -hmm. And I've injured so much crap in my body that I, I know I've been there. Mm -hmm. And they see me injured and they see me recovered. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think that being able to even tell yourself mm -hmm. what you need to do for your own internal health and well-being. Mm -hmm. I don't think that people respond as well if they don't see that you buy into your own system. Mm -hmm. If you're not exercising, if you don't appear fit. Yeah. You know, um, I, I think that people are going to have trouble respecting your opinion. Mm -hmm. Why should I? Why should I believe this person? Mm -hmm. So, being able to talk, being able to stay fit, or at least promote that fitness, mm -hmm. even if you can't do it, you better have a good reason. Yeah. <laughs> better have a good reason why you can't do it. And I just, I'm four months out from back surgery, and I'm back out killing it again. I'm running. I'm riding. I'm, Oh, wait, I'm not supposed to be running yet. Please don't, <laughs> don't show this to my dad. But I, I'm, I'm doing it with doctor's permission, I promise. Um, so I, I think it's important that, that you recognize that you have to recognize what your own inabilities are mm -hmm. in, in that same breath. Um, I think PM and R docs, I think they've got to be talkers. You've got to be able to put that together. Okay, so communication skills. Absolutely, absolutely. We talked about PMNR and you were a fellowship director. How would you recommend, uh, or what advice would you give to someone who wants to get into PMNR? Like, how would you match into PMNR, and then how would you get a good fellowship? If you go to a program where there's heavy research, and that's going to be your pathway because they have a very strong sports fellowship program, mm -hmm. and you want to at least appeal to the people at that program mm -hmm. so that even if you don't stay there, you can still catapult yourself into other programs mm -hmm. because that program director or the people working at that program are going to be known well enough that if you get a good letter from him or her mm -hmm. that they can then help catapult you into other places. Mm -hmm. I think we have a very strong fellowship program. We're very fortunate that we were one of the first five that had an ACGME, so that's mm -hmm. um, Council on Graduate Medical mm -hmm. uh, Education. So there were only five of us that got that first certificate. Mm -hmm. So from the get-go, we had a little bit of a leg up. But now that we're 11 years into it, it's important that through that time that we've trained the right people, that mm -hmm. we've that even if you couldn't get into my program, say for example, you went here and I said, look, I, I think you're strong, but maybe you're not strong enough to be here. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, Go look at some other places. You've learned what we've been able to teach the last three mm -hmm. years. Go learn from somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I've got a couple of folks that over the course of the next couple of years are going to be extremely strong candidates. Mm -hmm. But I'm counseling them, hey, three years with me and with my colleagues doing sports mm -hmm. medicine, you may want to go look elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Would I love to keep you here? Absolutely. Absolutely, but understanding that you may find that you're going to get better training elsewhere because mm -hmm. you've learned what I have to teach. Mm -hmm. There's a few little things here and there over the course of the year maybe, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day I want you to be as happy as you can be and find the program that's going to suit you. Mm -hmm. Let's say you go to a place that doesn't have a very strong sports program for one reason or another. You thought it was going to be good, it wasn't or something happens while you're there where you lose some of your sports faculty, anything can happen at any time. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes important to make sure that you have some type of um, uh, elective time where you can then go out and go work with other programs, go work with some of the other people who are the specialists in the field. Mm -hmm. Even when you're in your, your college and your medical school programs, go and seek out places where you can stand on the sidelines, where you can be involved in doing physicals at high schools or colleges. Mm -hmm. Building up that resume so that when it comes time for you to apply to these residency programs that somebody can say, oh, this person's already this far 
therefore he or she has leapfrogged this person who hasn't done that stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's no question that when we look at individuals for our residency program that we want as well-rounded of an individual as possible. Mm -hmm. So it probably doesn't look good to only show that you've only done things involved in sports medicine. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day we want that breadth and that scope because you're not coming here to just do sports. Mm -hmm. You're doing amputee, you're doing head injury, you're doing spinal cord. And I'll tell you, no question, when I went to those rotations in medical school that I could not stand, mm -hmm. I worked harder in those mm -hmm. than any other because I knew I was never going to see or learn that stuff ever again. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones that, OBGYN, <laughs> painful, <laughs> painful. Could not stand it, but I, I spent every waking minute I had during that eight week rotation trying to learn everything I could about OBGYN mm -hmm. because I just knew I was never going to see that stuff again. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you didn't really care about the compensation. You kind of let whatever that compensation was kind of come to you based mm -hmm. on how, how you're working. Um, could you just talk about how well PMR physicians are generally compensated? If you look at specialists in general, if you're for, if you're in private practice, you'll typically do better than you will if you're in an academic center. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that there's a lot more things that you're going to have to cover on your own, whether it's your medical license, whether it's having a drug enforcement agency license so that you can prescribe narcotic medications, things along those lines. Mm -hmm. Your licensing, your uh, your medical education courses that you have to keep up on. Mm -hmm. So being in private practice, it's absolutely essential that you have to make more because those things aren't going to be covered by somebody. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's covered by my revenues and by my department and all of my insurance and everything else. It's all packaged into one. So my actual financial compensation may be this much, mm -hmm. but there's another third of that that goes to my overhead, to paying my staff, to um, paying for my licensing, to pay for my board exams, to pay for my continuing medical education. Mm -hmm. So somewhere you've got to find that, that, that balance and be able to say, is this good enough to cover? And under most circumstances, PM&R is covered probably about middle of the pack when it comes to non-surgical specialists. Mm -hmm. So if you look at cardiology, it's probably somewhere up here. Unfortunately, our pediatrics and our family mm -hmm. practice tends to be closer to mm -hmm. here. We tend to be probably in the middle between mm -hmm. most of those folks. And I think we do pretty well. And the more that you work, the more that you're gonna get paid. If you're in an environment like this, where every year I have to, mm -hmm. to some extent, I have to negotiate mm -hmm. and I have to be able to say, well, this is how much I build. How much comes back in revenue isn't my fault because I've got billers and other people that I'm paying for. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to tread that thin line and let's say you're in some type of compensation package with your group, mm -hmm. with your organization, and you're trying to buy into practice or things along those lines, those are gonna be very important that you will basically get to eat what you kill. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's part of that whole that whole package. Now fortunately if you come into an academic center and there's already a strong program ahead of you, for example we just hired on another faculty who does sports medicine. Well we've already got five non-surgical sports medicine folks that are doing exactly what this person is going to be doing. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're already overflowing with patients means that this person is going to be ready to go like that. Mm -hmm. But maintaining that is going to be because you want people to ask for you. I want Dr. So-and-so. My kids saw him, my mother saw him, my priest saw him. Mm -hmm. You want to be that person that those referrals come to. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of that is going to be doing the right stuff. Am I getting paid well enough because I'm out there promoting myself, promoting mm -hmm. my program, getting on TV, all that other stuff doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. All, it all makes a difference in your compensation at the end. Okay, so you mentioned a little bit about like CMEs and mm -hmm. um, st uh, how would you recommend staying on top of, of this, especially because the information is coming out like crazy fast nowadays? Uh, wow, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, there's pros and cons to having all of that medical information at your fingertips. 
you can take online courses and you can get medical credits for that. I still prefer going to large conferences, mm -hmm. communicating with colleagues, seeing what people are doing that's new and latest and greatest. Mm -hmm. I like that format. Um, I still have to get some medical education mm -hmm. online or if I take an exam, I'll, I'll get credit for mm -hmm. that as well. So I just literally took my sports exam last Friday. Mm -hmm. Pray to the <laughs> Lord I passed that thing, it was painful. Um, Hopefully, I did. I'm not really worried, but um, but you get points for those as well towards your towards your continuing education. I think it's important to find things that are relevant to your practice mm -hmm. that can still be used for your exam uh, or for your specialty. Excuse me. So, for example, um, this last year I went to courses on ACL tears, reconstruction, management physical therapy geared towards some of the newer phases that are available because I deal with tons of runners. I wanted to look more at running biomechanics, running efficiency, uh, barefoot running, natural running, midfoot, rear foot. I, I wanted to look at all of that. So I tried to find as many courses in those areas because that's what I see day in and day out. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing more of general care, you're going to have to look at a more a wider variety. You might have to go to a course on head injury or do some online training in head injury or spinal cord injury, etc. Because there are certifications that are available for traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, neuromuscular diseases, in addition to sports medicine, we have to take our primary certification, so you have to have enough points to pass that, mm -hmm. but I also have to have enough points to pass my sports. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, my sports and my certification primary overlap, mm -hmm. so I don't have to worry about that. But you just want to make sure that stuff that, that's coming out that's new and latest and greatest that, first of all, you're not so far ahead of the curve that when somebody goes to test you that you're like, but I know all this knowledge. Mm -hmm. They're not asking for that. They're not ready for that, that, for that data. Um, <clears throat> And the question of how do I use the technology that's available? I, many times, I'll be in an exam room and there might be some discussion and I will just immediately go straight to the computer and say, I'm gonna go look this up. Mm -hmm. And I'll go find your reputable sources. You can't know everything. Mm -hmm. When I finished medical school, half of the genetic, uh, half of the diseases that were described for nerve and muscle disorders hadn't been described yet mm -hmm. in terms of where is the genetic defect. Mm -hmm. Well, now we know all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know all that stuff because that was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. you, know, you start talking about, oh my gosh, I remember the first time I heard somebody mention a hormone. I'm like, what? And they're like, you haven't heard of this hormone? I'm like, I, I, it's just, mm -hmm. it's every day. You, you've got to keep trying to stay on top of that curve. And I think that there's this, there's this blessing in this curse. Because you know that your internet is always there, right next to you, I can pull it up on my phone. If my computer is not working in the office, what I do, I put it right in my phone. Um, and that's fantastic, but you don't have that capacity come exam time. Mm -hmm. And I just read a study where they're actually finding that because of how much we're relying on our technology to remind us, mm -hmm. that we're actually forgetting it up here. And um, that's scary because in the old days, if you asked me somebody's phone number, mm -hmm. I could give you all nine or ten digits just like that. Yeah. And now, who cares? Yeah, but back then, you had to know that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you had to pack more junk inside your brain. Mm -hmm. And we're losing that. And we're losing that ability. And I, and I think that that's going to be something that's going to affect our clinicians down the road because we're so used to having that. Uh, that electronic environment available for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so um, with all the things that we have to keep on top of and uh, the hours are pretty intense as you mentioned, <clears throat> how, how do you avoid burnout as a physician? Uh, well, graduated medical school in 92. So here I am 25 years later and I, I think I think hospital systems and insurance systems, along with what we have to do for billing and documentation, I think are the biggest hurdles to physicians today. 
And those are the biggest components, in my opinion, of burnout. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be extremely efficient. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to say that I was the most efficient coming into this. Because in the beginning I was told, oh, you've got 30 minutes, every patient who comes in, well, you're not seeing that many patients at the end of the day. Then they said, hey, this isn't making enough money. Well, how do I move from an inefficient system to an efficient one? Mm -hmm. So being, I, I learned how to type. Please, Lord, you got to know how to type. Because if you don't know how to type, I, I would just tell you don't even bother going into medicine right now. Um, that is what much of your day is going to be that documentation and if you can survive that hurdle of documentation mm -hmm. I think a lot of other things fall into place mm -hmm. because less of your time is spent worrying about what gets into the computer mm -hmm. um, if you can get out at a reasonable time if your clinic ends at 5 you need to be out of there by 5 30 mm -hmm. um, I've got kids I have family I've, I need to make sure that I'm there and then you want to be a coach, you, you want to hang with your kids, you want to go on vacation, you have to have that time. You can't be saddled with your work 24-7. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to have other people working in a practice with you in some capacity so that if you disappear, somebody's there to help you out mm -hmm. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, I, and you may not always have that if you're in straight private practice. The burnout can certainly be a higher concern because mm -hmm. you don't have anybody that your office is not going to be making money when you're away. Mm -hmm. um, to me, if, at the end of the day, I get out of here, I go, I hit the gym, or I go do some stuff with my kids, and then maybe I'll go home and I'll finish up a couple of things that I didn't take care of during the day. Mm -hmm. Or I'll make sure that during my lunchtime, and I hate doing this, but instead of me going out to go eat lunch or going to take a walk, mm -hmm. I'll sit and I'll get my work done because I'll have my time to go after work. Mm -hmm. Is it the healthiest way to do it? Uh, you have to ask the internet. Um, mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I've been able to, to balance that out. Being an educator becomes tough because if you're writing lectures on a day like today, which is my development day, mm -hmm. I've, got to, I've got to use that time efficiently. Mm -hmm. So again, efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go home, I'll get some stuff done. Or I gotta take my son to the dentist, so I'll sit at the dentist's office. And I'll, be, I'll be doing my work. Yeah. Um, being efficient. I, I think I think smartphones have helped us in some way be efficient because mm -hmm. I can review data, I can review emails, I can look over charts, I can do things from my phone that I never was able to do before. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in an environment where I wouldn't have been able to get that work done before, I can now. Mm -hmm. At least being efficient and um, really setting deadlines for when you need to leave work and then start doing, take care of yourself and then getting back yeah. to work. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. Okay, so um, uh, last question. Uh, how would you recommend um, for all the med students and um, pre-meds even uh, watching, how would you recommend people become good doctors? Um, unionize. I, it's going to sound, it sounds funny. I personally believe that physicians in this day and age need to protect themselves against, for the interests of their patients. Um, I know that there are attempts today to try to bust up unions, but that's even more reason why I think we need to protect the integrity of medicine. Being a good doctor What's interesting is that if you look at the statistics on who gets sued, it's not the doctors that are perfect at everything, it's the doctors that communicate. Put a hand on a patient, cry with them every once in a while, be human. Let them know that you're human. People will recognize that, that component that you really care. And that to them becomes a good doctor. My doctor cares about me. My doctor listens to me. I can't tell you how many times I've had a patient say, nobody ever took this time with me. And it was only 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Somehow that 15 minutes seemed like it was an hour to them. Mm -hmm. What it was I did during that time or that moment for that patient, I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. 
but those are the things that, that people today are looking for. They want somebody who wants advice like you're giving to your mother, brother, sister, or cousin. Mm -hmm. They want to know that you are reading up on the latest of stuff. Mm -hmm. They want to know that you're a human being. It's fine to go search something on the internet. It's fine to say, ah, oh, you know, I wish I had told you about this last time, but I, I'm sorry, you know, let's talk about that this time. Um, they want somebody who's going to reassess and look at things and say, I didn't see that last time. When, when did that start happening? Or something as simple, I can look at the chart, I can see all their information. And, well, back in 2004 you had such and such. How did you know that? Well, you know, just because I care about you. Um, no, I just got it from your computer. <laughs> Having a sense of humor talking with your patients and trying to make them laugh during sensitive times mm -hmm. can be very important. Um, I think that all of these things just show that you care. Mm -hmm. And that really is being a good doctor as much as it is, did I study my butt off and try to do the best I could on my exams and try to get Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society? Sure. That stuff from the medical field, we look at it and we go, oh, this means that he or she is a good doctor. Mm -hmm. but I've known a lot of people that have that same alpha, omega, alpha, and they're terrible physicians. Mm -hmm. They're terrible clinicians. At the end of the day, it really comes down to being that human being, but trying to you know, cram as much as you can because when it comes to test time, you're not going to have that stuff there. Now, maybe someday if they make a more open book, which I think they should be because mm -hmm. That's the environment that we're in today. Mm -hmm. And is it fair that, oh, I missed something, you know, what percentage of glucose is best absorbed <laughs> in the stomach of a runner? Yes, that was on my exam. <laughs> it happens to be 7% in case anybody's interested. But that's information that I don't need to have on the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But in this day and age, if it's available, it's out there, and just use what you have available to you, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. Well, thanks again, Dr. Diz, for um, sharing your, your, your thoughts and your experience with us. It's my pleasure. Um, if you guys have any, uh, make sure to like this video, comment, subscribe. If you have any questions for Dr. Davis, uh, leave it down in the description or in the comment box, and uh, maybe I can uh, relay the information mm -hmm. from him to you guys. Yeah. Thank you guys for watching, and let me know uh, who you guys want me to interview next. And let me just make one other plug out there. If you're interested at the collegiate level, Go out and get your experience. Anybody that you can talk to, we bring people into our clinics all the time because we want you guys to get that experience. We want you to be face-to-face -face learning what you need to and getting that exposure and that experience. And once you get into medical school, look at who's available around you. Do the same thing because people who want to get ahead will get ahead. That's probably my best parting words. So uh, always work hard. <laughs> Right, I say, show up early, go home late, ask some good questions in between.